I noticed an interesting credit that you had a credit as spiritual advisor uh, on your dad's album. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I uh, I didn't do a lot of mixing on that record, but I apparently gave some guidance. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. It must make you feel good. It is. I, I get to work with my dad actually quite a bit, and really? it's and it's always a real pleasure. And your dad, of course, is Russ Kunkel, who's legendary drummer, producer. Uh, again, has a resume that uh, is just insane. It's 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 quite extensive. I actually, still to this day, they'll be you know I'll find records and that I'll be listening to and go, you played on this? He's like, yeah, you know, I did that. Awesome. And actually, I, I found this morning when I was sort of, you know, researching, I, I found a credit of your dad's that I had no idea is that he was on, in Spinal Tap. Oh, yeah. He was. He was in The Flower People. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that either. <laughs> so it surprised me at all. That's for sure. So where, where are we with the mix project right now? Uh, so right now we're trying to finish the thing up. It's been a, a long project. It's been going on for a couple of years now just because... It's just hard to get everybody together. And uh, I called Nathaniel a month ago. I said, we just got to finish what we have. So yeah. uh, we're maybe halfway done. We have like half the, maybe almost half the songs mixed right mm -hmm. now. So we're pretty close. I just want to get this thing wrapped up and get out of here and move on. But sounds, stuff sounds great. Really happy with it. And and I notice, I mean, there's not a lot of outboard gear here. So could you talk a little bit about your your workflow as a mixer? Sure, I'm, I mix it. <laughs> um, right, there it is. I, mean, I think you know every every project will sort of delineate what its process is going to be. Um, in general, I I really just try and keep things as simple as I as I can. I I bus internally in Pro Tools. I don't use an outboard summer. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I think I really got into trying to figure out how to make Pro Tools work for me like that because I was doing so many large channel count, multi-channel stem prints. So it just wasn't, it wasn't a reality that I'd be able to do external summing on it. Um, but, you know, I mean, my workflow is assign everything to a stereo bus, put a master fader on it, awesome. route the stereo bus to a, a channel and, and print it. Yeah. Do, do you feel that there was a point in time where it no longer became necessary to, for instance, take something out and sum it in the analog domain? You know, I think that equipment that we use in the studio has always had idiosyncratic things about it. Right. You know, you know, you could really lay into the stereo bus on an SSL 4000, but you couldn't lay into the stereo bus on a 9K. Um, and so y you just learn that you don't sit in front of a 9k and go, why can't I lay into the stereo bus? It's sort of what it is, right? You gotta, mm -hmm. as my friend Billy Williams would say, we get, you gotta dance with who brung you. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and Pro Tools has its own issues as well. And I think the more you work on any type of tool, you just, you learn the stuff that works and you learn the stuff that doesn't work. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think that. You know, that's one of the reasons why I've started gravitating towards the UAD plugs is because there's there's things that it will do that I can't get out of plugins in the in the in the native domain. Um, so I think it's just I think it's just more being aware of what you hear and being honest with yourself about what works and what doesn't work. You know, you can. There's some equalizers where you instantiate the plugin and you don't change anything about the the settings on it. It's in theory flat and it has an impact on it. There's peak limiters that when you use them, they'll they'll give you the leveling you want, but your but the depth of your stereo image will suffer. And um, so just like the difference between a 4K or a Focusrite or a 9K, you, you learn what those textures are and you learn to work within their limitations and get the most out of your tool that you can. So you're basically, you choose your tools yeah, and, 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 you and you work with them the best you can. Yeah, you listen. I mean, I think this, the, the, it was like when digital really came out, there was this sort of kind of false promise that if audio was passing through it, it was perfect, you know? And yeah. if, there's, if there's one thing that we all should have learned from Doug Sachs, it was that you can't do anything to digital and have it not change the way things sound. And um, I remember when we did a, 
we were doing a trio record, the second trio record at the site with George, that I was an assistant on, and we recorded it to um, analog and to digital. And George gave a speech at AES about it. And he, um, now this is several years ago, so hopefully I'm not going to misquote him, but the, but the gist of what he was saying was that when he listened to the analog playback versus the digital, the hi-hat in particular on the analog sounded more like the hi-hat did in the room when Jim Keltner was playing. And, um, and that as if you look at the way digital measures, it, it will usually measure better than analog. It'll have better IM distortion. It'll have better wow and flutter. It'll have better noise. Um, and, so as scientists, we have to acknowledge that there's something about that that we can't measure because it clearly is different, right? So I think that there's things that we can hear that we can't qualify, but that doesn't mitigate the value of the perception.